the members of the Science and Security Board moved the hands of the doomsday clock forward, largely, though not exclusively, because of the mounting dangers in the war in Ukraine. We moved the clock forward the closest it has ever been to midnight. It is now 90 seconds to midnight. How long does humanity have left? The doomsday clock says we are 90 seconds away from midnight after atomic scientists reset the predicted point of the world's annihilation in January 2023. Ready 23 at this point looks pretty dark. But what does that really mean? And where did the concept of the doomsday clock even come from? The doomsday clock is a symbolic timepiece showing how close the world is to ending. Midnight marks the theoretical point of annihilation. Every year, scientists move the hands of the clock closer to or further away from midnight, based on their reading of existential threats at that time. Cambridge University's expert on existential threat, Paul Ingram, explains. It uh, emerged at the beginning of the Cold War to, uh, to give a sense of the urgency uh, to achieve nuclear disarmament and to climb out of the abyss that we were facing in the early 1950s. And in more recent times, it has taken on climate change and uh, emerging disruptive technology to give it a sense of the risks, the catastrophic risks that we face uh, as a planet, uh, largely through our own uh, deliberate uh, activities. Albert Einstein was among a group of atomic scientists who created the clock back in 1947. The situation in Ukraine is very dangerous, explosive, and escalating by the day. Joe Biden's weakness and incompetence has brought us to the brink of nuclear war, and now Biden is doing what he said 10 months ago would lead to World War III. He is sending in American tanks. It's far past the time for all parties involved to pursue a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine before this already horrific catastrophe spirals out of control and ends up leading, indeed, to World War III. And this would be a war like no other war, because this would be a nuclear war. As I have said many times before, Russia's invasion of Ukraine would have never happened if I was in the White House. Not even thinkable, not even a possibility. We must end this ridiculous war and demand peace in Ukraine now before it gets worse. And believe it or not, it would be easy to do. It would be very easy to do. Are we as a human race sleepwalking towards the apocalypse? Or do we have a brighter future ahead of us? How many times you have heard the words, apocalypse, Armageddon, and Judgment Day in a non-religious context? As if our unconscious collective mind would recognize that the book of Revelation could literally come true in our time. Whether we want it or not. Despite this, many of those who use this biblical terminology from the last book of the Holy Bible mock those who still, in 2023, believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God from our Creator and that we should align our lives and values with its Judeo-Christian worldview and moral principles, not according to our own wisdom and delusive feelings. And when Judgment Day arrives, the whole world will know it. They will know that it will be the time which Apostle John saw over 19 centuries beforehand on the Isle of Patmos. They know it because all kings of the earth and the eminent people and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong and every slave and free person will hid themselves in the caves and say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? When this happens, will those kings of the earth, wealthy and the strong, bow down before the king of kings? And will they lead their nations to praise him, in whom we have our only refuge in the day of trouble? No. They will instead give their power and authority to the Antichrist, and lead their nations to worship him.
and they will gather their armies to go to war against the King of Kings, the Lion of Judah, when he returns from heaven with his saints to establish his everlasting kingdom on earth. Many generations in the past have believed that they would see the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Could we really be the generation who will witness it with our own eyes? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 6, Apostle Paul said that there were over 500 people who witnessed Jesus' resurrection after his crucifixion. Most historians of today, even atheist ones, acknowledge that the Christian faith is based mostly on historical eyewitness accounts, and the early Christians really believed they had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus with their own eyes. But when he comes to earth the second time, Apostle John says in the book of Revelation, that every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Then every knee will bow down, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Then also the house of David, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, as prophet Zachariah foresaw it, will look at me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him, like one mourning for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Have you ever wondered why Jerusalem is constantly at the focal point of our news? Or, why there is so much hatred among the nations for this small nation? If you believe our secular media, you may think that it is because of Israel's wrongdoings in the Israel-Palestine conflict and its supposed violations of international law. Or so they have told us. But they can make anything bad because they are the fake, fake, disgusting news. But if you have a biblically aligned spiritual understanding of our reality, you would see that it is because the forces of light and darkness in the heavenly realms are preparing for their final holy war over the city where our Lord was crucified. Although Jerusalem is considered a holy city, among all three major monotheistic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, in Quran, there is not, actually, a single mention of the city. On the contrary, in the Bible, the city is mentioned 667 times in the Old Testament and 139 times in the New Testament. And not only in the historical sense, the city has a central place in the biblical end-time prophecy. It is not just the place, the Lion of Judah and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, returns to, and to where he establishes his millennial kingdom, of everlasting peace and righteousness. But according to the Holy Scriptures, it is also a place, where the Antichrist will start the final persecution of the Jewish people, after he desecrates the rebuilt Temple of Jerusalem, and causes abomination of desolation. After that, as Prophet Zechariah saw it, the God of Israel will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be taken, the houses plundered, the women raped, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be eliminated from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west. The Mount of Olives was, according to the New Testament, the place where Jesus ascended to heaven. It was also a place where he spoke to his disciples of the signs that precede his second coming on the earth. In the Garden of Gethsemane, which is on the Mount of Olives, he fought his last spiritual battle for the redemption of our souls. And to the Mount of Olives, he is also returning when he arrives on earth the second time. In the coming coronation of King Charles III of United Kingdom, in May, he will be anointed by the oil which was made from olives gathered from the Mount of Olives, manufactured in the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, and consecrated at the place of his death and resurrection at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Charles personally visited all of those biblical places in his first state visit to Israel as Prince of Wales in January 2020. Today what we have is um, a wonderful historic moment where the oil for the anointment of uh, His Majesty King Charles III is being consecrated here in Jerusalem in the land of the Holy One and uh, specifically in the Holy Sepulchre. 
a place that is the most holy place for Christianity around the world. This is a sign of the connection of the and the link of uh, the uh, royal family of the United Kingdom and more specifically of uh, His Majesty King Charles with the Holy Land and of course the Holy City of Jerusalem and more specifically with the very part of the earth that has been sanctified and blessed by the redeeming blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This connection between the British royal family and the Holy Land goes even much deeper when we consider that according to tradition and legend, they are the modern house of David as the direct descendants of King David and Solomon. When Charles is coronated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, he will use the so-called Stone of Destiny, which, according to this legend, is believed to be the stone pillow of Jacob that ancient monarchs of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah used in their coronations as well. Then, King Charles III has also many personal ties to the Holy Land and its peoples. When he was born in 1948, the same year the state of Israel was born, he was circumcised by a Jewish mohel, Rabbi Jacob Snowman. His paternal grandmother Princess Alice of Battenberg saved the Jews from Nazis during World War II and is recognized as righteous among the nations by Israel's Holocaust Memorial Institution, Yad Vashem, and her remains are held at the Church of Mary Magdalene on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Because of these connections, and because of Charles's friendly relations with the British Jewish community, one reporter said in 2015 in the Jewish Chronicle, the world's oldest Jewish newspaper. I am sure that Charles will be a king for the Jews. But we know from the Holy Bible that there is only one king of the Jews, their foretold Messiah, Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and the King of Kings, a stone which the builders rejected, our true stone of destiny. All others who claim for themselves the title King of the Jews are Antichrists, since the Greek word Antichrist means one who claims to be the Christ, Messiah, and who opposes the real one. According to the New Testament, there are many Antichrists, not just one, all of which originate from among the Christian Church. Could it be that King Charles III is not just one of the many Antichrists, but that he is actually the Antichrist? Exactly. That's how most people would react if you say this to their faces. Even if they agree with the premise that such a figure as the Antichrist is coming, they would probably say things like, Nah. He's too old to fulfill the role of the Antichrist. Or, He's too unpopular and lacks the charisma and authority for such a role. But statements like these only demonstrate their lack of understanding of the biblical end time prophecy regarding the man of lawlessness and the persona of King Charles III. While it is true that he was very unpopular as the Prince of Wales, and could be also unpopular as His Majesty Charles III, one important prophecy in the Book of Daniel told us specifically that the Antichrist will be a despised crown prince, to whom his kingdom's subjects didn't want to give the majesty of kingship. This is, by the way, the title of my 426-page book, so I recommend buying it. Although my book covers all biblical prophecies concerning the man of lawlessness and how Charles is already able to fulfill all of them, my book focuses, in the most detailed manner, specifically on the prophecy of Daniel 11. Daniel 11 is perhaps the most important of all biblical prophecies concerning this man. Why? Because it doesn't only reveal that this man will be a literal king from the heredity monarchy, not a president or a prime minister, but that his predecessors were Gentile monarchs who ruled over the Holy Land, as Charles's predecessors did in British Mandate for Palestine after the First World War. Charles's grandfather and grand-grandfather, George VI and George V, who ruled the British Empire, history's largest empire, between 1910-1952 were the only so-called Christian monarchs besides the medieval crusader kings and pre-Islamic Roman emperors who ruled over the Holy Land. Just like predecessors of Antiochus Epiphanes of the Seleucid Empire, of whom this prophecy spoke in its first fulfillment phase, ruled over the land of Israel in the second century BC, the same must apply to this final Antichrist and his predecessors. 
In fact, as I have demonstrated in my book, there is a dual fulfillment of Daniel 11, where it doesn't only foretell the ancient kings of the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires, after the partition of Alexander Great's empire, but also all subsequent events in the Middle East and the Holy Land. Those include events like the Great byzantine sasanian War of 600-628, the Arab conquest of the Middle East, the Crusades, the Ottoman and Napoleonic conquest of the Middle East, and finally the British conquest of Palestine during the First World War and all subsequent events that led to the establishment of the modern state of Israel. Like many prophetically awakened Christians already know, rebirth of the modern state of Israel in 1948 was one of the most important historical signs that we could be the generation that will witness the second coming of Jesus Christ. Those Christians who studied the biblical end-time prophecy foresaw it centuries before it came to pass. I am speaking about Christians like Sir Isaac Newton, a devoted student of biblical prophecy and one of the most important men in history. Isaac Newton saw it centuries beforehand, but only because the Hebrew prophets of the Holy Bible had foreseen it millennia in advance. As foretold by prophet Jeremiah, this is what the Lord says. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you out with kindness. I will build you again and you will be rebuilt, virgin of Israel. You will take up your terrible rides again and go out to the dance of the rebels. Again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The planters will plant and will enjoy the fruit. Sing aloud with joy for Jacob and be joyful, the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise and say, Lord, Save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I am bringing them from the north country, and I will gather them from the remote parts of the earth. Among them those who are blind and those who limp, the pregnant woman and she who is in labor, together they will return here as a great assembly. They will come with weeping, and by pleading I will bring them, or I will lead them by streams of waters, on a straight path on. They will not stumble, for I am a father to Israel. Hear the word of the Lord. You nations, and declare it in the cost lands far away, and say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and he will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and redeemed him from the hand of him who was stronger than he. In the so-called Little Apocalypse, a sermon by Jesus on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and in Luke 21 concerning his second coming, our Lord spoke about this coming oppressor of Israel, whom he associates with Daniel's prophecies on Antiochus Epiphanes. From this, the students of biblical prophecy have extrapolated, since the earliest church fathers, that this person whom Daniel foretold in chapters 8 and 11, doesn't concern only the ruler of the ancient Seleucid Empire, but also his coming counterpart, the last Antichrist, who will be at war against God and his people. While the pre tourist school of eschatology points out correctly that many of those signs of the end in the little apocalypse of Jesus refer to the events of 70 AD when Roman army destroyed the Jewish temple and expelled the Jews of the Roman Judea to diaspora, they ignore that many of those signs also didn't come to pass at that time, like Jesus' literal return on the earth. Since for the same reason, as the prophecy in Daniel 8 and 11, can refer at the same time, to two or several different historical time periods, so too, Jesus' prophecy on the end times, can refer to two different time periods in history. And we know, that they must refer to two different temple era. To the era of Jerusalem's second temple, and the era of the coming third temple. We know this, for example, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 24, where Jesus said, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. We could assume that those times of the Gentiles, mentioned by Jesus, have already fulfilled, due to the fact that the Jews have controlled Jerusalem since the end of the Six-Day War of 1967, but we could also assume that they are not yet fulfilled, since to this day, after their expulsion from Roman Judea in 70 AD, the Jews do not have sovereignty over the Temple Mount, their holiest mountain where the Temple once stood. 
But now, for the first time in the nation's 75-year history, they have a government that supports the Jewish sovereignty over the Temple Mount and the Third Jewish Temple, a dream that the ultra-Orthodox organization called Temple Institute have tried to bring into reality. At least, that has been the public stance of Edomar ben Gvir, current Minister of National Security and Benjamin Netanyahu's government, even though Netanyahu himself supports the status quo on the Temple Mount. In his position, Ben Gvir supervises also the security of Israel's holy sites, including the Temple Mount. That's why his short 15 minutes visit to the Temple Mount in January 2023 caused such massive international uproar. The State of Israel, the greatest miracle of modern times, celebrates its 75th birthday in May, just a few days after King Charles's coronation. Many prophecy students have deduced from Jesus' fig tree parable of Matthew 24 that the generation that was born at the same time as the State of Israel would not pass away before the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the same way as the generation of Jesus didn't pass away before his prophecy on the destruction of the Second Temple and Roman Jerusalem came to fruition in 70 AD. In Psalm 90 and verse 10 it has been said, the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to strength, 80 years. This happens to be an average life expectancy of the most people today, in the developed world. Considering that the generation that was born in 1948 would start to disappear after the year 2028, although a few of them would live yet another 20 years, we should expect to see the rise of the Antichrist right now. Not in 20 years or even 10 years, but before the end of this decade. And the book of Daniel, to which Jesus refers in his prophecy about the Antichrist, says that this person will be a literal monarch from the Gentile kingdom that ruled over the land of Israel during his predecessors. Daniel chapter 8 verse 23 tells about him. A king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. And his power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree. And be successful and do as he pleases, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people and through his shrewdness he will make deceit a success by his influence, and he will make himself great in his own mind, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes, but he will be broken without human agency. According to this same chapter, this king will be first, a small horn, a world leader who are seen rather insignificant, but whose power and influence grows exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land, or the land of Israel. As the biblical terminology uses only the four cardinal directions for the compass, a previous phrase seems to suggest that this king's country of origin is in the north and the west, or the northwest, from the land of Israel, as we could say to be true in the case of the United Kingdom. Daniel 8 also ties his country of origin to the Kingdom of Greece. Although the entire Western civilization, which would include the United Kingdom, as heir of the ancient Greece, King Charles III is an heir to the modern Kingdom of Greece too, as his father Prince Philip was born in Greece into the royal family of Greece and was a grandchild of King George I. Daniel chapters 7 and 9 also ties his country of origin into Roman Empire and associates him with Roman princes and emperors. Not only was Britain part of the Western Roman Empire, but Roman Wales retained for a long time its independence from Germanic invaders, who divided the empire into ten kingdoms in the 5th century, as foreseen by Daniel in chapters 2 and 7, and which I have discussed in detail in my book, by the way. For that reason, Charles's previous title Prince of Wales means etymologically Prince of Romans, since the name Wales is derived from the ancient Germanic word for their Roman neighbors. And then, Charles's own English forename is derived from Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, the medieval king of the Frankish Empire, whom the Pope Leo III crowned the Emperor of the Romans in 800 AD, and thus deprived this title from Byzantine or Eastern Roman emperors, and transmitted it to the Western Catholic rulers of the medieval Germany and France. King Charles III is a direct descendant of Charlemagne, and in the medieval period there was many prophecies from Roman Catholic mystics, where the coming Antichrist was associated with this person called the last Roman Emperor, or the Great Monarch. In those prophecies, it is often mentioned that this person would be a direct descendant of Charlemagne, and that he would be called also with the name Charles. And believe it or not, but Charles happens to be also a direct offspring of Prophet Muhammad, as noted by his official genealogists, and he is known for his pro-Arab sentiments and speeches that praises the Islamic faith. 
So basically, King Charles has those unique ties to every major religions and Christian denominations, which enables that one day, he will be exalted and worshipped by them all, as foretold in Revelation 13. Just as Jews expect their Messiah to be a direct descendant of King David, Muslims expect their Mahdi to be a direct descendant of Muhammad. Even Buddhists and other Eastern religions are awaiting their own Messiah called Maitreya, who is believed to come from the West. According to now deceased New Age guru Benjamin Krem, he lives specifically in London and would fulfill also the role of the Islamic Mahdi, Jewish Messiah, and second coming of Jesus for Christians. Since the early 1980s, Charles has been an open promoter of the Eastern mysticism and his esoteric New Age beliefs and is also a close friend of Dalai Lama. On the 21st of March, the United Kingdom, with King Charles III as its head of state, signed a seven-year agreement with the State of Israel. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 foretold that the Antichrist would sign such a seven-year agreement with the revived State of Israel, and that covenant with death, as prophet Isaiah called it, would trigger the last seven years on the earth before the second coming. Although I'm not saying that this was necessarily the final seven-year deal that the Antichrist shall confirm with many for seven years, it is undoubtedly a crucial step toward that. Think for a moment about what could happen if there would occur an incident on the Temple Mount of Jerusalem that would cause a major international uproar. If Israel's Department of National Security under Edomar ben Fur would take Temple Mount under their control from Jordanian WAC and would allow Temple Institute to build their desired third temple, that would cause all major powers to intervene on behalf of 1.9 billion Muslims. Those major powers do not recognize Israel's international right to East Jerusalem, let alone to Temple Mount, even though it is the holiest place on earth for religious Jews. In such a great clash between three Abrahamic religions, who could be the best candidate to resolve the dispute and bring about the necessary compromise between those monotheistic religions, each of which claims the holy city as its own. Surely, it could be only a man like King Charles III, who has all of those aforementioned ties to major Abrahamic religions and their holy city, and who has spent his whole life cultivating his relations with those religions, doing his best to bring them together as the defender of all faiths, as he wished to be known in his TV interview from 1994. Only a person like Charles could be asked to visit Jerusalem by all major Abrahamic religions to resolve this conflict about the international status of the Temple Mount and the Holy City of Jerusalem. In a documentary called Stairway to Heaven, he is already praised by Muslim leaders for the role that the previous Prince of Wales had in the reconstruction of the medieval member of Saladin in the Al-Aqsa Mosque of the Temple Mount. And he is also a close friend of King Abdullah II of Jordan, who is overseeing the current status quo on the Temple Mount. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21 says that the Antichrist will be a despised crown prince, to whom his own people shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. A few years after inheriting the kingdom from her ancestors, who previously ruled over the land of Israel, he will send forces to desecrate the Temple of Jerusalem and remove from there the regular sacrifice that Jews have reinstituted, according to old Mosaic law. And after that, they will set up the abomination of desolation. Jesus spoke on this same event in Matthew 24 when he said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, i.e. the Temple Mount, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get things out of his house. And whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those women who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that when you flee, it will not be in the winter, or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will again. We should take note that when Jesus gave this warning to Jews who will reside at that time in Judea, this is the area that is more commonly known as the West Bank in our Western media, because in today's Israel, it is not called West Bank by a name that refers to its illegal Jordanian occupation in 1948, but as Judea and Samaria. It comprises most of the area that was known as the Roman Judea during the life of Jesus and today the United Kingdom, together with the international community in the United Nations, claims the Jewish settlements in West Bank and East Jerusalem to be illegal under international law, 
even though the United Kingdom recognized the illegal annexation of the West Bank by Jordan, which was never recognized by any other democratic nation under the international law. In fact, it was the United Kingdom under Charles's grandfather George VI that didn't only restrict Jewish refugees' access to Palestine during the Holocaust, when it was their only safe haven from the gas chambers of Nazi Germany. But after the war, they also tried to destroy the newborn Jewish state, which had just risen like a phoenix from the ashes of the Nazi crematoriums. There are also many documented examples, which you will find from my book, of blatant anti-Semitism within the current Royal House of Windsor, which is actually the German Royal House of saxe coburg gotha that either supported the Nazi appeasement policy of Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, or in the case of abdicated Edward VIII, committed treason with Nazi Germany against his own countrymen. Even in the case of King Charles III, we have evidence from the insider's account and from Charles's own private letters that have been leaked to the public that he is not the most passionate friend of the Jewish state, and some of his views on it, and on Jews in general, hover in the realm of classical anti-Semitism. So no matter how hard, he now pretends to be a friend of Jews and a defender of every faith. He is just an impostor who is coming to betray the Jewish state and also the Christian church. As Christians, since the earliest church fathers have warned that the Antichrist will do, before the second coming of our Lord and Savior. So to finish with the words of our Lord. See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will mislead many people. If anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or he is over here, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you this in advance.